um, Joe, and he can um, introduce our speaker. So, thank you. Hi, welcome. Um, we really don't want to um, exclude anyone, but um, we do try and focus on um, the 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 professional community. Um, I'm Joe Eaton. I'm a member of the board of the Psych Portland Psychedelic Society. Um, I'm a, a trip sitter, uh, retired mostly, um, and lead this group and a couple of other groups. Um, Gwillem was on the board until, um, I don't know, nine months ago or so, maybe a year ago. And um, I got to know him through that. And he's an amazing gentleman with an incredible amount of information. Um, he has been dwelling in this land of psychedelia for 50, 40 40 years, years, 50 54, years, 54, 54 years, 54 years. Um, and, and the only thing I can say um, negative about him is um, if you take him out and buy him a beer, he will, he will entertain you with endless stories. Finding out that he's Irish explains it all. Um, but the stories are really quite remarkable. He has a, he has, a, it is well worth, if you see him on the street, drag him into a bar, buy him a beer and get him to talk and he will go endlessly. Um, he really has an incredible amount of information about many things, but um, about Salvia particularly, um, it is, it's, it's his, apparently his, his, real, his real baby. Um, I don't know, what else should I say about you, Gwilym? That I'm an artist. Oh, yes, oh, of course. He is a local artist um, who does incredible work. He has, um, um, he has a radio station that he's doing. He has, he oh, has, oh, oh. Uh, he's selling various things online. He has a website and, um, you know, one of the things you get to do when you, when you um, uh, work for us is you get to plug your, your, your basic <laughs> enterprises. And so we'll expect you to do that, Quill. I'll plug it at the end. Yeah, great. And he has tons of, of um, places to go to, to check things out and learn about things um, uh, that he will tell you about in the end. All right, I think that's it. Willem. Well, welcome to my studio, as you can see. This is where I do most of my work. I do painting upstairs, but this is where I do a lot of writing and I do a lot of my digital art and also my publications, which I do a lot of. So enough of that. I'm gonna be reading, I have copious notes, so I'm not gonna be staring right at the screen all the time, just to let you know. So here we go. This is the introduction. Without the research and friendship of Leander Valdez, Daniel Seibert, and Dale Pindle, I would not be giving this presentation tonight. Part of the talk that I'm giving tonight is derived from an article on my experiences with the compound Salvinorin A that was published in the Enthusian Review in 1998 by John Hanna. This was one of several articles I did using the techniques of bioassaying. All explorations of these amazing plants has been a cooperative effort through the ages, not only on the human side, but on the plant side. Leander brought solid science to his investigations and shared his observations freely and in most helpful manners to me and others with great humor and friendship. His research in Mexico and at the University of Michigan should be widely applauded. Daniel Seibert, who was an amateur researcher, uncovered much of the mystery that is salvia and also provided the first online forum for those of us who were curious about this amazing plant. There's a couple of the old members here tonight, in fact. Daniel supported my art efforts, trying to bring to the visual world, world what we were experiencing with salvia. Dale Pindle, my late dear friend, not only participated in the early research and trying out techniques and focusing things for using salvia, he brought a poetic spirit to bear on his description and praise of this marvelous plant in his groundbreaking book, Pharmacopoeia. Folks, if you do not have this book, I swear you need to pick it up. 
It's an amazing piece of literature. There's three more in the series. Buy them if you love plants and all the other compounds. So that's that's an advertisement there. So John Hanna's work with the Enthygen Review, Mind State Conferences, and Airwood has greatly contributed to where we find ourselves now currently with psychedelic explorations and forums such as the Portland Psychedelic Society. I give gratitude to these guys and to my plant companions. So we will cover in this talk such topics as cultivation and caring for salvia, getting to know the ally through growing the plant. Salvia chemistry, what makes salvia unique in the psychedelic pantheon? We'll be dealing with set and setting for the trip experience. We'll talk about the therapeutic use of salvia, common themes from trip reports and people's personal experiences. You know, what, what is the space like? And from the Theogen Review, I'll be giving a high-end Salvia A trip report of my own from that time period. And if we have time, I also have a synopsis of Salvia history, as brief as it is. So here we go. Cultivation and caring for Salvia. Here are some of my thoughts on the cultivation of Salvia and why you should cultivate it if you are going to engage with her. Salvia divinorum is perhaps one of the easiest plants to cultivate. In past presentations, I've called it a psychedelic tomato. So meaning that takes, meaning that taking care of it and propagating it is akin to the care I would give to a tomato plant. I've grown salvia for 26 years. At first I was terrified that the plant would die at any moment due to the rumors that were circulating about it at that time period. In truth, it likes Oregon weather, especially on the Western slope over to the ocean, except for deep freezes in the wintertime. It doesn't like a lot of direct sunlight and needs to be watered frequently as it wilts, just like a tomato plant when there's heat, just don't overwater. It is difficult to, to grow in dry climates. You have to keep the plant in a moisture tent or a shaded greenhouse that doesn't get overly hot. Again, it doesn't appreciate a lot of direct sunlight. This is a plant that grows underneath the canopy and it grows up in the mountains of Oaxaca. So it, it's not really hot, it's pretty moist, but you know, the plant does like a certain bandwidth. You can plant salvia into the soil after April 15th due to the fact that this is usually the last days of frost in Western Oregon. And dig it up and put it into a pot for the winter months. Feed it on a regular basis. By the autumn equinox, you should have an abundance of leaves to harvest. When I harvest leaves, I trim them off carefully from the stem of the plant, leaving a couple of small starter leaves at the top. I tie string around the stems of perhaps 10 to 20 and hang them to dry inside my garage. Salvia can be grown from seed, but it is notoriously difficult to do so. It has been posited that salvia is a hybrid of two other salvia plants. I may talk more about that later on. It is far easier to take cuttings and just let them sit in water with what is called root tone to you get a root about that long. And then you plant it into a little, little pot and just keep it watered or pot it directly into the soil. If you use this method, you trim off the biggest leaves and just leave a couple at the top so the plant puts its efforts into the roots and not the leaves. You should on occasion remove the starter leaves at the top, which will make the plant form more leaves below. When you do this, the plant will really, really bush out. These things can get as high as a meter, maybe a meter and a half high. So they can get pretty, pretty big and they just, they love attention. Like many plants, they thrive on it. 
They seem to love our interaction with them. Remember, you are dealing with a living, intelligent entity, not intelligent in a human way, but something far older, more ancient. When you walk the poison path with the teacher plants, you are treading into ancient fields of the goddess. These are highly conscious beings, not conscious like us. It's a completely different form of consciousness if you've ever accessed them. Salvia will sometimes have a stem fall over. This is a survival tactic. As these branches serve as runners, it will put down roots and sprout new shoots along the top of the stem and root down through the stem into the soil. So it's, it's something else to watch. It's fascinating to see the plant explore its territory, which of course is a human term. What the salvia plant is doing at times is beyond my pay grade level, seriously. Salvia on occasion will, walk, will flower. Weirdly, it is often in winter when this occurs in Oregon. I posit that the plant is still on Oaxaca time when it does this. Hummingbirds are attracted to these flowers, both here and in Oaxaca. They probably are the cross pollinators, of course. So over the years, I've given away hundreds of cuttings. And this is a plant that has thrived along humans for perhaps thousands and thousands of years. Salvia chooses her people. I suggest that you pay her a visit and find out if you can establish a relationship. So I first obtained cuttings in 1994. I grew and propagated the, those initial cuttings into several plants. I grew the plants for perhaps a year, year and a half before I began exploring what salvia had to offer. My thoughts ran like this. I would get to know the plants and they would, get, and they would give me a cue when the time was right. I'm a firm believer in cross species communications, especially with plants. So it was winter time and I had to move the plants into the basement of our house off of Hawthorne and 22nd to avoid the freeze. At that time, I had my artist studio in the basement, much like here, and spent a lot of time down there. So one late winter afternoon, I was setting up a painting and I had this nagging feeling behind me. It's like, you know, like when you feel like you're being watched, you know, you, you're all probably familiar with that feeling. So watched or observed. I turned around and the only living beings or beings in that room were the salvia plants. They were gently swaying and yet there was no wind, no breeze or air being pushed about in the basement. I stood there transfixed. As I stared, a plant at the front suddenly dropped a leaf. I nearly jumped out of my skin, as you can imagine. It's one of those memories that stick with you. What I am talking about is not only cultivation of a plant, but building a relationship. This is perhaps foreign to modern times, but it is not unknown in the West in days gone by. You'll find old tales of people marrying a tree, for instance. There's lots of these stories. You just have to look for them, usually in fairy tales, okay? There's a lot of truth in fairy tales, believe me. I would suggest to anyone who truly wants to explore a plant or say a fungus to grow them and discover the relationship that is possible with a power plant. If you do so, you'll find that your growth will flower, so to speak. It is not a one-way relationship. The plant as well benefits in many ways. It gets propagated, shared, and explores the world in its own way. I know not everyone can grow plants, but if you can and are interested in salvia, this is a path that I strongly suggest you investigate. There are online sources for the plant and cuttings. A local store, the Dragon Herbarium, used to sell plants. I sold many of my plants to them or, or they distribute them out. It's worth your time to check to see if they have them in there. So it's a local source for you. I'll be providing at the end of the talk a link and everything for information for tomorrow. So we're going to talk about chemistry. So salvia chemistry. This is a quick synopsis 
and what makes salvia unique on the chemical level. Salvia does not fit into the classical description of a psychedelic. If you attended my talk last year at the Clinton Street Theater, I talked about onergenic plants, which is to say dream-inducing plants. Salvia, Kalia, Zakatichi, I would say opium, et cetera. This is an important distinction in describing salvia's interaction with this, the idea and the concept of onergenic. Most plant psychedelic compounds are alkaloids. In fact, almost all of them are alkaloids. Salvia is different though. Even in this, it is a ditropine that is the active ingredient. The foremost ditropine in salvia and the, most, and the very first to be isolated was salvinorin A. Salvinorin A, this is very important because I'm talking about dosage level here, is active at 500 micrograms. For a plant psychedelic, this one far outstrips all the others for efficiency and effect. 5-MeO-DMT is active at a threshold of three milligrams, and DMT is active at a threshold level of around 19 to 20 milligrams. So you can extrapolate the numbers there. There are a whole host of other dipenes in the salvia plant. They are still under investigation at this time. If I recall correctly, other compounds within the plant may react synergistically in creating the extraordinary variable effects of this plant, maybe by inhibiting the lytic acid action of an enzyme or digestive juices. Truly, the actions of the salvia plant are a true wonder. Research has shown that this compound is interesting for many reasons, but recently it has come to the attention of researchers because it acts as a kappa opioid receptioner agonist. It is, first, it is the first known compound acting on this receptor that is not an alkaloid. Again, this is highly unique. The K opioid receptor is a protein and is one of four related receptors that bind opium-like compounds in the brain and are responsible for mediating the effects of this compound. These effects include altering the perception of pain, motor control, and mood. Scientists have investigated the effects of salvinorin A on acute pain, oedema, and formalin-induced persistent pain in mice. Researchers have concluded that salvinorin A exerts analgesic actions and also shows moderate anti-inflammatory effects. More recently, salvinorin A was used to research the relationship between the colostrum, the sheet of neurons, which is attached to the neocortex at the center of the brain, and consciousness. This suggests that the consciousness-altering effects of salvia divinorum or salvinorin A are due to a K-opioid receptor mediated inhibition of primarily the colostrum and additionally the deep layers of the cortex, mainly in prefrontal areas. This finding leads them to believe that salvinorin A might be new evidence in favor of the Crick and Koch theory from 1990, which claims that the colostrum is the conductor of consciousness, not unlike the philosopher Rene Descartes claiming for the pineal gland. So that's it for the chemistry. So now we're going to start getting down to the meat of the subject. We've got some background and now we're going to start talking about set and setting. So this is for you who are going to be using this plant. And always important, the basic fundamentals for the cell experience. And I'm giving you tried and true techniques. I've done all of these. And Dale Pindle, and other people as well. A whole host of people added to this. So here we go. Salvia's requirements for set and settings are as unique as the experience that salvia offers. The three methods that I'm going to describe are one, the quid method, the tincture method, and what is called the bridge of smoke. I suggest that you need to have a sitter for all initial encounters. In fact, if I were there, you know, I would, I'm available for this at the end of this whole stupid pandemic. But believe me, have a sitter. I cannot emphasize that enough. Please do this. Okay. So my technique that I use, and I've been develop, developing this technique off and on for all those years, is that one should meditate on your intention beforehand. 
you can set your attention to several paths with your interaction with salvia. If you're going to follow the path of divination, lay out your inquiry. Okay, get it set in your mind, think, think it through and everything. And within yourself, you repeat the question or what you want to know three times. You vocalize it three times. And then if you have an altar, take a sheet of paper and you put that on your altar. Okay. If asking for clarification on the life on a life path question, I suggest that you formulate the question, repeating in your mind again three times. There's a bit of magic in this. It's like setting setting the focus. This is very important, I believe. So here's where we step into it. When you're first going into this plant, you need to have absolute silence. Okay, it has to be a quiet place, quiet room. The plant doesn't brook a lot of light. Okay, so you need extremely low lights or no lights on. If you're having a sitter, you could be laying out on the floor, there could be a candle over in the corner. That's fine, but it's not shining in the Voyager's eyes, okay? Because it, it will absolutely negate it. It's one of the strangest things. The light goes on, you're out of the zone, just like that. So I, also suggest, I suggest lying on the floor with a pillow under your head. And why do I do this? Well, some people flail around. They go all wacky and stuff like that. They make noises, they moan, they groan. If you ever watch somebody on 5AMA or DMT, you might get the idea of what I'm talking about. So one of the other things that you could use with this is use copal. It's a traditional incense used in the Mazatec ceremonies. It seems to work really well with this. It has a nice setting for it. My preferred time for my interactions with salvia is midnight. Perhaps this is a superstition, but I do believe that the veils between the worlds are thin at this point. It also helps that there is less ambient noise at this time. The added bonus is that you active that after actively exploring Salvia space, you can drift off to sleep. And as I talked at Clinton Street, you can have some of the most amazing lucid dreams at this time point. And I would have a notebook at the side of the bed. So in the morning you get up and you write down, especially if you're going in there with intention, not just to visit, but you know, you wanted questions answered. Some of that stuff will come through during the dreams. I hope that makes sense. You'll find that if you use it late at night, that your dreams usually are lucid, as I've said. There is a lot of processing going on after the initial time spent in the possession of this ally. Okay, so you have this real high period, but the plant, the material is still cycling through your system for hours and hours. You just have to learn how to figure that out and how to catch the alerts. So I'd like to describe now the three distinct ways of using salvia. The classic way of using salvia is the quid method. You can use between six to 20 leaves, okay? The quid method is the traditional method used by the Mazatec people and other tribal groups in Oaxaca. It is best to use fresh leaves, but you can use dried leaves if you don't have access to fresh. With fresh leaves, it's pretty easy. First, you wash the leaves, you dry them gently, and you use a razor to cut out the central stem. Then you roll all the leaves together into what is called a bolus or a quid. This resembles a really fat cigar or a big joint. To use this technique with dried leaves, you soak the leaves for like 10 minutes and wash them off. And you pat them dry, use the razor, and you do the same bolus or quid with them. So I put the quid in the side of my mouth in here and I suck and I chew on it 
don't let the fluid particularly go back. You want the you want it to to bathe your the mucosa in your mouth. Okay, try to hold it in as much as you can. So I chew it a bit with my teeth, and then I put it over the side and I suck on it and go back and forth, back and forth. Just lay there quietly. Really good to have a bowl at the end of this because you're going to be spitting some of the stuff out as well. So you'll be squeezing that the quid out. Dale used to eat the leaves. I never could. So it's pretty interesting when he talks talks about that in some of his books. So you'll start feeling your first alerts in about 10 minutes. After the first alert, I generally remove the quid and put it into the bowl next to where I am resting on the floor. You will find yourself going inward and of all the methods used, this is the most long lasting. I find the heightened form of effects lasting for two hours, generally speaking, one and a half to two hours. A little bit longer with a few leaves, but it isn't like the length of a mushroom trip or anything like that. You can say two hours in and out. So in my viewpoint, this is the most profound way to use this wondrous plant. It's the old way. And, you know, these people had thousands of years to figure this out and uh, just saying. So the second method I want to talk about is the tincture method, which was developed by Daniel in 1999. It isn't that far removed from the quid method in the, in the technique, but I find it a little less comfortable because the alcohol in the, in the tincture, now holding, holding the tincture in the mouth for me is uncomfortable. It not, may not be that way for you, but, you know, different strokes for different folks. You ingest the tincture and hold it in your mouth, under, and you hold it under the tongue basically, and the suggested amount is about 10 milliliters of his, uh, of his tincture. You'll feel the effects within 10 to 15 minutes, and you'll hit a peak that lasts 20 to 40 minutes, then you'll slide back down in about 30 minutes from its plateau doesn't have as strong an effect as the quid method, but it's potentially a lot less messier. It is, very con it is a very convenient method to use, but unless you know how to make a tincture, it is very expensive in my opinion. You could make tincture, but you have to be very careful in the production of it. If you decide to make it, be sure to use ethanol, alcohol, as your base. I would suggest Everclear or a better vodka, okay? Seriously, this is the way to go with this stuff. I will not cover the method of production here, as you can find the instructions online. You can also always contact me, and if you can't find them, I will let you know. Okay, the third method is known as the bridge of smoke, and I believe Dale named it. So, and this is one that most people are familiar with. This method was developed in Mexico in the late 80s, early 90s, and it wasn't used by the Mazatec people, but you know, people from Mexico City and other cities that had discovered salvia and they're bringing it out of old Hawka and everything like that. So the original method was to take two leaves, dry them, put them to a pipe and smoke it. It is a copious amount of smoke. It's really hard to take. Uh, they were using giant bongs for a while made out of uh, five gallon water bottles and stuff like that when it was first around it. It's kind of hard to achieve salvia space with this at times. And sometimes when you do, it's just, it's freaky. But a lot of times people would just cough it all out because it's just too much smoke. And this is the way that I tried it originally. It is very difficult to inhale that much smoke. And it's perhaps it's not so great for the lungs. Actually, I'm sure it's not great for the lungs. By the late 1990s though, extracts were being made in 5x, 10x, and 20x. This made it much easier to use for the smoking technique. So let me explain how to do this one. Here are my suggestions when you use an extract. Again, set and setting is paramount. You gotta have a sitter with you at least for your initial voyages. If you've ever used DMT or 5-MeO DMT, you know how fast and how strong those come on. This is just as fast. And folks, a lot of times much stronger. 
if you misjudge the dosage, you can have quite the ride. My advice is to start low, which means very little substance in the pipe, and then you can dose upwards if needed. I have done this, and I developed a technique which doesn't shock the system. Okay, you might want to try it once to shock the system and see, just to see what I'm talking about. But I found that you can take small amounts every minute or every 30 seconds, so you go into the space without this huge shock to the system because you're stepping into a maelstrom. You're an absolute different universe if you do too much. But there's one good thing about this technique. You're only in that space between five to 15 minutes. So even if you're uncomfortable, it's like DMT, you know, you can come out of it and you'll, you'll be fine. But there's a lot that happens in that short time, I have to tell you. More than likely, you'll be thrown into a space that is totally alien on one part, but incredibly like home on the other. Remember that it is quick acting, and the best thing to do is to surrender and observe. Believe me, just surrender. You can't fight it. One of the great difficulties of navigating salvia space is that on the way out, you can forget what you garnered inside that space. But there's a caveat with that. When you go back into that space, all that you garnered earlier tends to be there waiting for you to examine again and deeper. And eventually, you can take it home with you. And here's another good thing about salvia. You can repeat the going into the salvia space rather rapidly. I find that I can revisit it within 15 to 30 minutes without any decrease in intensity. So that's your basic set and setting setup. So Let's talk about that for a second. You need darkness. You need not a lot of noise or no noise if possible. And you have to have what? You have to have a sitter. Please, please have a sitter, okay? At least for your initial voyages until you know the territory. Because it's it it can it can be pretty freaky. So Right now, I'm gonna talk about some of the freaky aspects of it in themes in salvia reports. Certain themes are common in many reports about salvia space. Uh, one of the big ones is becoming an object, for instance, uh, a tire. I've heard somebody said, I became a tire on a car. I thought that was kind of neat. And then one time, we were laughing about it and later on I became a sheet of turquoise paint on my family's 1957 Chevrolet Impala. So these are not, how would you say, normal psychedelic experiences. But uh, then there's other things. We've got lots here, so I'll, I'll carry on. So there's visions of various two-dimensional surfaces. Something, sometimes the experience opens up vistas that stretch to infinity, but you can't get out of the two-dimensional side of it. You don't have a three, it's all just like flat land, okay? You can stretch out to infinity, but you can't rise up out of it. That's very, very odd. Revisiting the past. You can experience moments from your childhood that you have forgotten entirely. This is odd. some of the stuff that comes up, you know, it's like uh, the memories and stuff like that. This is one of the best things I think about this tool is that it can cough up some things that you get to examine and work on later on. So there's also the profound loss of the concept of the body and identity, the absence of ego and the absence of the concept of a separate self. So, and oftentimes there's sensations of motion be, where you're being pulled and reshaped in two different directions. First time did salvia, my whole, I sank into this infinite, oh gosh, shape. And I went down and just twisted me through and just like spiraled my body or whatever form I was into that. And then poof, that was gone. And I entered someplace else. It's a very odd feeling. So here's another one. And this one's an interesting one because I'm going to have a small story tied to the end of this. Visiting locations you have never been to before or seen photographs of. Locations verified by others. 
who have been there in this life. So in 1998, I smote salvia one night. And the next thing I know, I'm in a cartoon. And you remember those rolling cartoons of the 30s and the 40s? And I'm in this desert and all these cactuses are dancing and they've got like sombreros on and it's just like one of those musical cartoons. And the next thing I'm going up this slope and it started to become more forested and forested. And all of a sudden I'm moving, I'm moving very fast, very fast. And I'm zooming quite along and all of a sudden there's this Indian, this Mazatec Indian standing there. And he's going back and forth like this. And he's like going this way, this way, this way. And so I take off that way and I'm going along. And just as I reach the destination, it's this huge, huge mound of salvia plants in this ravine. And I dive into it and I realize that I'm a hummingbird and I've been flying through the desert to get to the salvia plants. So I told this to Daniel Seibert at the 19... 99 or 98 conference at Brighton Bush on Salvia. And he stood there and his mouth dropped. He says, you just described the pathway into Oaxaca from the Western desert. I was, I'm, I haven't been there yet, but I plan to seriously. So yes, you can go places you haven't seen. So there's also this experience of overlapping realities living lives in different dimensions simultaneously, multiple versions of you, whether it's exact or not, it doesn't matter, but there's just, you're existing on all these different planes simultaneously, and you're not aware of it in general, but in this space, you catch a glimpse of it. And there's a caveat with that as well. Having to make choices on which reality to come back to. Sometimes when you see all those, you can't, can't I go like, well, am I going back to the right one? I don't know. I think I'm here. Was this the one I started out in? I'm not too sure sometimes, but here I am. So you can come back as one of infinite versions of the self or as some other being, plant, etc. So here's another one. And this is one that I have found specifically with uh, the quid technique. Becoming one with the plant. You experience the plant looking through your eyes, your body, exploring your mind, perceptions, your life experience, examining you thoroughly. Another way of expressing this would be to say it is a form of divine possession, as if by a daemon or a deity. And the other thing that happens with this is that you start to feel the tendrils of the plant you feel the leaves and the stems and you become the plant and you can feel yourself swaying in the breeze and you can feel the soil and all of this. That's unbelievable. But there's this melding of consciousness between you and this incredible being. And there's the profound examination of your life, your life path, your heart and your mind, reassessing your actions. And sometimes having recall of, of possible past lives. Sometimes you have forward visions. In other words, visions that predict something occurring in the future and having the experience of recall after the event transpires in your life. So you enter into a different realm with this plant. And it's a realm that I find well, well worth examining. So let's talk about, as this is a medical forum to a degree, let's talk about therapeutic use. What is the therapeutic use with a plant that seems to be such a wild card in our deck of plant allies? On one hand, salvia's somewhat brief arc of perceived effects is similar to 5-MeO or DMT in length, which seems to be a non-starter for therapy applications. It engages, somewhat far, it engages somewhat far differently than MDMA or mushrooms. 
The one compound that might be considered similar would be ketamine, which as we know, has proved itself to be very efficient in helping with depression, etc. So it would seem at this point that I have to make a case for the therapeutic use of salvia. It is used in a, for a variety of applications in the Mazatec world at high doses. And now listen to this dose, you go nuts. If you've used salvia, you, you hear this, and you say, what is he talking about? So somebody who's an alcoholic, they come into the curandero or the curandera, and they give them an application of between 50 to 100 leaves. And this is afterwards as well as like the ritual bathing. And they cure the person's alcoholism. The person dries out, starts becoming a full member of their society again. So it's very effective for that. And it's used for a variety of physical ailments, for stomach ailments, uh, for pain, as we've heard about the analgesic aspects. So Maria Sabina, the Mazatec Kirandera, worked with salvia when mushrooms were not available for her healing ceremonies. Although she preferred the mushrooms, she was not above using salvia to help others in her community. I can speak to the therapeutic benefits of salvia through my own experience with it. I find it has helped me on several levels. It has an uplifting effect for days after the experience that I would say it can serve as an antidepressant. After usage, there is a sense of well-being that extends to all strata of my life. As an artist, it has helped me immensely to open up new avenues of creativity. This painting right back here that you see, you see all the stems of the plants, okay? Each stem is from one usage of salvia. And I would go in and ask, how do you want it to be painted? And she would give me the report. And each stem of that and all the eyes and everything were done under the direction of the plant. So this was a new experience for me. I've never really worked in tandem with a, with a vegetable being before when it comes to art. So it helps with creativity. You know, it opens up these vistas. When you think you've seen it all in the world and you've experienced everything through any of these plants, salvia will open up visages of immense possibility by revealing the infinite dimensions that we coexist in. This was perhaps the greatest gift to me, knowing that there was something beyond this earthly existence and that there were possible expressions of my being elsewhere in different dimensions. The sheer playfulness and humor of this ally is not to be dismissed. There's a deep well of joy and a sense of loving with her. Bill Pindle once stated, the gods were the plants and we developed consciousness through our interaction with them. In my experience, this has been proven out. It is a comfort to find one immersed in nature on the most profound level and not separate as the human world at this time would have us believe. It's, that's a gift. In my long relationship with this plant, from the very first days of growing it to talking about it now, I have deeply benefited from this relationship. I think it should be considered in the pantheon of healer plants as a noble ally. With right use, preparation, and meditation, and the inner work afterwards, and I emphasize that what you bring back, you work on, you observe, you mull it over, and you think on it, okay? It gives you a gift, do not squander. Salvia can and has benefited many for thousands of years. So now I'd like to move on to the Salvinorin A trip report. This is extracted from the article that was published in 1998 in the Theogen Review. Although we have covered three techniques for accessing salvia space, this trip report illustrates another method. So a bit of background history. Salvinorin A had previously been isolated in the laboratory in a university, and the first batch of it was just being produced in independent underground labs. Because I was doing bioassays at this point on various compounds, like from the shulgins and stuff like that, 
I was sent several samples from this first batch before being distributed to get my feedback and opinion. There was a curiosity among the chemists and other related communities of what the effects of the higher doses would be like. This report from the Entheogen Review article is part of my response. I have further writings from these forays, which I may make available in the near future. So here we go. Ingested the salvinorin A with a slight modification, used in a straw that was longer this time, about 3.5 inches instead of two inches. Sitting on the edge of the bed, watching the crystals melt and the salvinorin A slithering up the straw, even before I could taste it, Everything slows down. This is strange, stronger than before. It has grabbed me before I am ready. Why am I so surprised? I reach out to turn off the light and my hand stretches into infinity like rubber. Warmth envelops me in a crescendo of light blue and cream streams of luminous ribbons of light. After what seems a decade, my head feels the pillow reaching up and taking it gently. As my head settles down, the top part divides and hides again and again. It is hydra-like whipping back and forth in a gale wind of consciousness until it is Medusa-like. Every part of the head now snake, now a snake writhing with faster and faster force. Everything is cream and light blue, cartoonish and gibberish as each head sends back images and sensations into the central part of my being. It is a form of collective consciousness. I'm aware of myself and the room with my love lying beside me. At the same time, it's a maelstrom, a hydra, a thousand upon thousand headed serpent being under a huge dome of sky, writhing in an ever quickening and slowing dance on a plane that stretches into infinity. My love's breathing echoes and resounds, voluminous and full of beauty. The, head, the serpent heads slowly morph into each other until singularity occurs. Then for a moment, peace, utter peace. All of a sudden, an entity rockets into consciousness from behind, pulling all along with it and into it from the right side as it streaks past. All thoughts and self run in, runs into it like mercury pooling, silvery and voluptuous with movement. Being is flowed out as the observer self to watch the detachment. This being that had appeared takes on the appearance of a man of middle age, ongoing to somewhere quick. Had the beingness that moments before been hydro-like now attached to a natural traveler, passing through a shared zone, a place where all this passes out, where all this plays out. Then as quickly as it had come, the being looks back into me with deep detachment and departs, streaking away, leaving trails of our shared momentary consciousness bubbling to coalesce into moving pools of light. The mind moves from thought to thought like a sailing craft on a sea tacking back and forth into whirlpools and out again. All flows with such ease and warmth in and out of different beings and states of consciousness. The universe is liquid and malleable. All life flows with a harmonious, harmonious ringing. How would it be best expressed? A sloshing sound? Liquid sounds take form everywhere in wit and pull consciousness into pools and depths blending away personality and recreating beingness into myriad creatures and situations, all going on simultaneously. All moves and reshapes into new and unique beings, momentary expressions of life formed for beauty's sake and then submerge back into the ocean of consciousness. Evolution is played out over and over, not as predator and prey, but as co-players in a dance of delight and shared mutual joy and recognition. Awareness flickers off and on, being the strobes on and off, from day into night into infinite play and dance, consciousness wings out and refocuses back and over. 
Within the strobing, the salvinorin A exposes itself as it opens up and I see within it a flow, a river of salvia consciousness and how it has established a strata within my being that is now ever present. It is a flowing universe, river and skylight, both liquid and cloud, as if I've opened up a trapdoor just below everyday thoughts. Ever present, exulting consciousness, teaching, playing, and guiding. It is a love that flows into my being, whether I allow it or not. Her face is revealed, glowing, entranced singular. I cannot recall how it ends. I drifted into sleep during the night, but as I write this now today, I still feel the flow. I think it has always been part of me. Now I know that in, geoth in geothenic flow, we all become aware of. It has been with me my whole life, but this has distinct elements of something new, a different creature altogether. It is present in the trees, in the land, in the sky, as part of shared awareness. It envelops and comes whispering up through consciousness like smoke. And isness ever present, an Akkadian stream behind thought, seen in faces shared since the beginning. It is the river within the soul, intertwined with all thought, conscious, loving, and completely enveloping. And that's my talk. So if you have any questions, please ask.